Hello, everybody. Today we'll be talking about the data-driven approach to the design, and I would like to introduce you to Peter Parhominke, who's got a 24 years experience of custom and product development uh, in the EU, Russia, USA, and UK markets. He's a problem solver who's passionate about design, human behavior, and developing products that people love to use. He specializes in building and enhancing teams and client engagement. And he's also a fan of a 5Y method. Uh, so I'm, um, I'd like to remind that uh, uh, you guys should be proactive. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And when asking questions, please add your name. Uh, there is a prize of a year long license for Balsamic app for the most interesting question. It's going to be either the question that gains uh, the most votes or the one that our speaker finds the most interesting. So I'm passing the word to Peter. Please start. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. So thanks for joining today. <coughs> Uh, thanks uh, to Rina, thanks to all our producers, and thanks to you. It's a long day, and I hope we are not alone on this uh, webinar. I'm not sure that I can see who is online. Irina, can I see? No, I can't see. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I expect that someone here. Yeah, so uh, uh, today we will talk uh, about different uh, uh, type uh, of data. So I'm pretty sure that uh, everyone is familiar with uh, uh, the general idea of data driven, uh, but uh, and I'm pretty sure that you know that uh, it, it's uh, two different type uh, of data. It's uh, qualitative data and uh, quote data. So that's our uh, talking is about. So uh, and uh, uh, a few words about me. Uh, so uh, I'm pretty long time in design and uh, it was, I think, around more than hundreds of different type of projects. Uh, but uh, all this time, uh, it's not really fighting with uh, customer. It's not really fighting with uh, for the end users uh, happiness, but, but uh, it's not so easy. When you start something from scratch, uh, you need to be sure uh, that uh, you've got uh, enough information uh, to be sure in your decisions. And today I try to share with you uh, some insights from my recent project, uh, and I hope it will be useful for all of you. And today I'm not alone. Uh, I ask uh, Ali to join me. Uh, so it was in really very last moment, but uh, thanks Ali that you joined me. And uh, a few words about Ali, probably he want to self-present yeah hey folks uh, my hey. name is Ali and I've been in design for quite a while I've been you know busy designing the future of work for a large enterprise uh, I taught at uh, Notre Dame University where you know I talked about uh, system analysis and taught the fundamentals of computer programming with Python which is something really useful and I encourage everyone to learn so Pete thanks for the spotlight words for you you're welcome uh and uh, I continue. So that's the funny picture, but uh, I hope uh, it explains a lot uh, about uh, this uh, general difference between quantitative and qualitative. So on the left uh, screen, you can see myself. Uh, so I'm on the bush uh, and uh, I'm looking uh, and just counting uh, the number of uh, guys who takes uh, a free ice cream. Uh, and uh, on the right, you see uh, that's Ali who asks users uh, about uh, the user's feeling. That's, and that's the qualitative data. I'm pretty sure that the simple, I'm pretty sure that everyone know what's that, but just to be sure that we are on the same page. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing uh, that uh, in data-driven design, uh, we can uh, mix power of both uh, of this way. And uh, today we are talking about something in the middle. Uh, and so let me start from my story. Uh, so there. Title is uh, design is simple if uh, you've got right data, and uh, so all the story about that uh, it's really simple 
it's all simple, unexpectedly simple, and but you need to be sure that data is right. So long story short, uh, around a uh, year ago, uh, I was uh, my team asked me uh, to consult them with uh, ongoing project, and so that's the few details about the project. Uh, it was in production uh, more than six months. Uh, it's um, iPhone application and uh, they uh, were in uh, App Store around six months uh, and uh, their customer and the owner of this application is some kind of uh, online media, online newspaper. Uh, and uh, the main functionality of the application, uh, they are uh, working in uh, Foursquare segment. Uh, so this it's a little bit slightly different uh, with Foursquare that uh, in Foursquare, so everyone posts uh, the information uh, in the UK. It's not uh, everyone easy to trust. Uh, someone options about different places, but uh, here they uh, publish uh, on information from your friends, so you can you can be sure that uh, you see the proper review and so on and so forth. And so in uh, this application, you've got your own friends, uh, you've got uh, different places. So for example, it's uh, you can uh, select on the Mac some uh, restaurant and uh, uh, give a review for this restaurant and you can create some kind of lease from uh, this uh, restaurant. Uh, so uh, the main section is friends, uh, your lists uh, and uh, your notes. Uh, so they've got a lot of uh, statistics for this moment. Uh, it was in production, as I said, six months uh, and they've got a uh, setup of Google Analytics and they've got some data from App Store. So if it was enough information about uh, what the users do inside the application. So, but, <laughs> but they ask me, uh, so, the customers feels, feel that something is wrong uh, with the applications, but uh, they uh, want sure that uh, why. So they've got data, they've got some users, uh, but uh, the customer not happy. And they ask me, uh, please look on our application and uh, uh, give us your expert opinion. So, and uh, please, uh, I ask you to do the same things exactly right now so on the right that's a real screen from this application so you see we've got some user that's users profile so uh he's got 100 review and he's got 39 subscribers uh and so the subscribes back so he's got a lot of not a different list with the restaurant some special plans in barcelona and so on and so forth so uh that's pretty real, and uh, if you can uh, provide some of your valuable feedback on uh, what uh, you advise to change here, please send it uh, in our chat. Uh, that's one screen, and the second screen uh, is the same. It's not the same screen, but it's the same application. So that's different part of application. It's lists, so you can see a lot of information, uh, different uh, country, different cities, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's uh, let's do some short <laughs> pop quiz about uh, what you think we can change uh, here. So that's uh, the real option, really. So uh, we discussed this customer all this stuff. So uh, the option one one was beautify UI, uh, and uh, they create some special uh, content, consent, not a consent. Uh, so they create some special competition on the third party site uh, and uh, they've got winners from some Seoul Asia. Uh, so another option then for the customer discussed with development team uh, was uh, launch uh, the application on Android and uh, it was uh, pretty clear for customer that uh, uh, our uh, audience uh, is uh, not uh, wild enough and that's why we are on the on iPhone uh, if we will uh, start with Android uh, it will be increased. Uh, the third uh, option the option number C is uh, second look on statistics uh, and uh, the best one uh, D is uh, from Mighty Python is do something completely different. 
because uh, nobody uh, uh, was sure what to do in that moment. Uh, so that's probably spoiler, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I hope uh, you guess the same. So yes, before we start uh, beautification, because before we start uh, the second platform, uh, uh, we can uh, do something really there easily. Uh, there, uh, so we can uh, see on our statistics. So second look and uh, what we find uh, in statistic, what we find there. Uh, so that's uh, the real information from the real application uh, and uh, what we see. We see that uh, we've got 122 private lists uh, and uh, we've got uh, 337 uh, public lists, uh, but just uh, 20 of this list shareable. Uh, in fact, that means that uh, users use uh, lists there. They use this functionality, but the idea that uh, the users share this list between each other is wrong. Okay, the second uh, part uh, is uh, the things, uh, how many lists uh, got the people. So you can see that uh, Nine one thousand nine hundred have got just one list. Uh, oh, this is around thirty-two for two lists and so on and so forth. So just uh, two guys uh, have uh, more than ten lists, and uh, the major uh, audience is here. And uh, uh, it's not so looks so bad. Uh, probably it looks like uh, they uh, try to create at least one list, uh, but uh, no, that's wrong. Uh, the the first list uh, was after created, so <laughs> uh, it looks like nobody in this application never create uh, any list. Uh, but you see, we've got some users here, and uh, I uh, dig deeper and uh, understand uh, that's this pretty same slide. But here, it's not uh, the number of leads; it's the number of subscription. Uh, it doesn't matter really what uh, what's that, but the important thing is that uh, the main number of users uh, hide it here and and they don't uh, use uh, the application properly, but someone used. So we understand that uh, we've got uh, 29 uh, active users and uh, my question uh, was uh, who are they? Because uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, why? You see, uh, the statistics show us uh, that uh, the small number of people, the small group of people, use it completely different than the uh, minor, than the general group. So I asked uh, my team uh, about. Please show me the name of these uh, people, of this uh, who, the someone who has more than uh, 10 lists and they sent me a list by name uh, and uh, uh, not only with names and number of subscription but uh, with uh, uh, the relation of this guy to the project and we understand that uh, the guy number one, number one in uh, this his activity and application was the customer <laughs> himself uh, and uh, Eight from the first ten, it was uh, some guys who really very close uh, affiliated to this uh, application. So, uh, and uh, but uh, let's help us understand that uh, that uh, the guys who need to use it uh, to. To, for work, for example, like developer or someone who put the content like affiliated media. Yes, so they use it a lot uh, and uh, the biggest group are of users don't use it at all and uh, so how it helps that's the data okay that's the data so let's do the next step and try to use uh, this data properly uh, so you see uh, we start this uh, the screen on the left i show it to you and oh, sorry and uh, it's pretty good picture. You see, that's a lot of activity inside the user profile, a lot of subscription and so on and so forth. But the reality show us uh, that uh, there is no review, no subscribers, no subscription, and just uh, one after created list. Uh, and uh, when you <laughs> look on the second screen on the right, uh, I hope your imagination starts uh, works because uh, for me, that make uh, a lot of mo more sense than the left one because I have no idea uh, what I can improve on the left one, but I am pretty sure that I can improve the right one. Uh, and 
on the second screen is the same. So uh, in fact, for majority of users, it was uh, empty application. And I know how to fix it. So it's pretty simple, uh, but uh, and you know, that's the common uh, thing. Then uh, you ask designer, please uh, start work with some wireframes. Uh, uh, and uh, designer ask you what data will be inside and uh, you tell them just, just put something to be sure uh, that it will look uh, pretty on design. And um, that's how it looks on the left. So that's just designer's idea uh, about how it will be. But uh, in this uh, unique uh, case, uh, uh, we have data about how the users really use it and they <laughs> use it uh, like on the right side. Uh, so uh, what I... <sighs> So from that, uh, the real redesign uh, could start. Uh, and uh, so uh, we know what kind of uh, issue we've got, so we can resolve them. Uh, if uh, we see that uh, there is no friends inside the application, we can put on the main screen on the really very beginning uh, of uh, application usage uh, on the main uh, area we can put uh, the thing that uh, help you to invite uh, uh, your friends so uh, for example uh, the next one if we understand that the users got the empty feed we can uh, put uh, some uh, uh, information from our media or, or from uh, users with uh, something similar in the profile like age uh, location and so on and so forth uh, so it was uh, recreated uh, and you see some new screens and all the screen uh, based uh, on uh, our idea how we could resolve the situation. Uh, yes, and uh, that's uh, a few impacts uh, from uh, this redesign. Uh, so right now the deadline uh, of uh, start of Android uh, version is missed and <laughs> they out of schedule around 10 months. Uh, and uh, the main application, the main application in App Store uh, doesn't uh, have any updates for last three quarters. But uh, during this time, for last nine months, uh, customer uh, saved around uh, 200 uh, thousand dollars on development. So there is no development, uh, no cost for development. Uh, and uh, a couple of uh, takeaways from this project. So that's not enough to have uh, analytic data because they've got a lot of data and they uh, base their work uh, and their development uh, on this data, but in fact it doesn't help. Uh, so you need to understand uh, how, who is the uh, real users, uh, who is the more active user, who is, what's the majority of your users. You need uh, to check the main, main functions inside the application. You need to empathize, uh, so uh, put you in the user's uh, shoes uh, to be sure that uh, you can understand what's uh, the real picture, so and uh, you can align it in your design. Uh, I think. Uh, that's all. Uh, so from my side, uh, I can turn it uh, to Ali. Ali, please continue. I can hear you. Please uh, unmute. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so uh, what? What? Pete has just been talking about is how quantitative analysis has helped, uh, you know, redesign an application and save money in the process. Uh, in part two, I'll be covering how qualitative UX research has helped, right? So user experience research really is like a box of chocolate. Um, so today I'll be talking about, today I'll be talking about how we, you know, used qualitative data uh, in our project to help refine our hypotheses, uh, to help steer the design, steer the product into the right direction. So qualitative data played a really serious impact uh, on the overall process and on the overall you know, life cycle of the product. So a little bit about the project. Um, 
I've been in touch with MakerBrain, who's an award-winning toy, not game company, toy startup based in Beirut, Lebanon. I think you've all heard the news now. You know where Lebanon is on the map. Um, and MakerBrain's mission was to produce a universal constructor toy that integrates with most of the popular toys in the market. So they have this you know, set of parts which knows how to connect with different toys, it knows how to connect with Lego, Little Bits, um, Meccano, uh, Arduino, uh, just you name it. So our job was to bring this, uh, you know, physical play, um, physical play mode into the web, like digitize this play, enable kids aged from seven to teenagers aged 14 to be able to, you know, construct something in the browser using those parts uh, and all the other parts, right? So connect maker brain parts to Lego, to Meccano, and just, you know, enjoy it. This has been no easy feat, really, and I'm just about to share a story with you. So why and how did we decide to do a user experience research and when? When? Most importantly, when have we decided to do it? So we've had our initial hypothesis, uh, which was, you know, a web builder, uh, which was validated with very frequent all the way usability tests. So we've always con uh, collected feedback. We got people just to sit down and try to build something with this builder. And it turns out, well, they managed to do things. And we were quite sure that, OK, this interface is usable. This is indeed what we want. And our main hypothesis in the in you know all of this was don't want to clutter the UI, right? Because there are tens of thousands of parts from different constructor kits and just showing them all on the screen at once would just overwhelm the users. So this is how our UI looked like. We had a navigational ribbon, right? We had a workspace where we could build stuff with the basic tools that, you know, we emphasize on because those are the toys that, you know, MakerBrain has built and wants to advertise in their builder. We had a toy library which enabled users, you know, just to dream up anything they wanted. So I want to build with wheels, I want to build with platforms, and it would just throw in the most relevant results there for them to use uh, in the workspace. Now, this all worked, but I was a bit skeptical. My question here remained, was the builder fun to use? Like, is, it works, it seems to work, but is it fun? So to measure how fun it was, we needed the user experience research. Uh, and well, like anything you do at any company, you'd have to run it by business. You'd have to, you have to run it by the CEO. Um, so I just went to the folks and said, "Hey, I need to run user research before we go live." And they're like, "Hey, ho, ho, we 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 have a launch soon. No user research. We're done. We're done spending money. Let's go. Let's go to uh, let's go to launch." Uh, the only quick, so I need to act quick, and the only quick way meant that there is no time, you know, to approve any budgets three weeks before launch. No. So how I made this happen is I just I leveraged I leveraged on, you know, we uh, the startup was in the in an incubator space where there were tens, maybe a hundred, close to a hundred of other startups, which. Um, you know, which was full of engineers uh, who had kids. So I had to reach out. So I went and reached out actually to many of those uh, to recruit our target audience, you know, age seven to 14, basically for free. Uh, I leveraged on the incubator's largest auditorium. I booked it on a weekend, so it costed us zero dollars. Uh, we've integrated free tools for the research. We'll talk about those later and uh, the research was to take place on a Saturday. It's an unpaid day, so no one gets extra pay. Uh, and I'd require an idling, ready idling. Like we're, we're close to release. We have no research. We have no data. So the UX team is idling and uh, just giving them one week to analyze some data after the research, uh, after the experiment would just come at no extra cost. So all in all, all in all, this research was basically you know, it, it happened because, you know, it costed nothing and it didn't it didn't shift the timelines. This was the only way to convince uh, management about it. So what was the experiment? You had to obtain the parental consent, right? You cannot do any research without obtaining consent. And we managed to get 30 kids with their laptops uh, for one and a half session, uh, one and a half hour session. 
uh, at our auditorium where for half an hour they would finish a tutorial that we've set up and for one hour they'd, they'd be asked just to do whatever comes to their mind and just explore the tool and try to build something that they like. Uh, after that, we plan to ask a simple feedback question, you know, kids, uh, and we left them a reward. Like we we order a, a ton of pizza and well, I paid for that <laughs> and offered 10,000 in-game coins uh, as soon as the product launches. So the tools that we went for was, you know, a, a focus group like we got those kids all together uh, in this large auditorium. Uh, this is the CEO, <laughs> you can't see him, but then and we've ushered uh, around and just made sure that the kids are building something and everything's all right and just monitored, observed and took notes. And we've also, so I pushed to integrate Hotjar, the the usability analytics tool. It's like, you know, your, your Google, Google Analytics, but on steroids and tailored for UX research. So we got that on board too. And well, as the experiment unfolded, we had some observations, right? So the players have successfully, you know, learned how to use the tool based on the tutorial. So the tutorial was effective, the mechanism worked, um, but something something wasn't right. The resulting creations that we, they were making were all unfinished. Like there are things uh, laying around, nothing is connected. They were just exploring the parts, uh, rotating them around, placing them in, in random positions, and not, you know, not not making anything with those. And, this was this was this was something we took note of. Um, so, to the question, would you use this builder again? That we asked the kids. They frequently said no, we won't. And you know, kids don't lie. And this is something brilliant about kids, really, when doing user experience research. They don't lie, so they tell you how it is. And when you ask them the first why out of the five possible ones, they 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 get to the butter. They tell you because I didn't know what to create. Like the they just, you know, it seems that they, they were, they were pointless. Um, disgruntled a little bit, maybe or upset. But on the other side, I had, you know, a rock fall off. So, yeah, something was not right. My hunch was right. And what can we do about it? Like we gathered this heat map data, and as you can see here, uh, we superimposed like 35 different heat maps um, of all the players to just see where they were clicking. And okay, obviously, and the expected result was that they were clicking somewhere in the workspace. They were clicking on parts, trying to assemble something. Um, no one really used the search, right? There was, there's just some blue spots here, like meaning that well, no one clicked here. And obviously a pretty clear region S, which we refer to as, you know, the area where the autocomplete suggestions appear when they search for something. So clearly those areas were neglected and this indicated that, well, our users were not using the search. So our main hypothesis failed just by taking a look at quantitative data, right? And they wandered pointlessly here and just didn't do anything with the search. So with, with simple quantitative analysis, we, we knew that they were not using the search, but what was the problem, right? We didn't have enough context uh, of, okay, what to do next, right? So we turned to the 3,100 minutes of screen video recording that were captured during the experiment on every screen, right? So every kid who was playing had Hotjar anonymously collecting screen recording footage. Um, and we just sat, we just sat and analyzed for days up to a week. We just sat with the team and looked through the videos and here's what, here's what we found out. Right, so the search feature was indeed not used. So the quantitative data was confirmed. Uh, no one's using the search. The second point, uh, we noticed a lot of, you know, pointless cursor wandering around the screen. Like the kids didn't know what to do. They just wandered. They looked for something on the screen, which just couldn't find. Um, and this indicated that, well, they were lost. So this is important context, which was provided by the recording, something we couldn't see with the uh, quantitative data. So the screen recordings, unstructured qualitative data showed us that, you know, our users are lost. And maybe one of my favorite points was that 
we, in, the, in our initial design, placed the focus on the aggregator parts that make your brain build, which seemed like a very rational decision for business. Hey, we're putting our part first and the kids are interacting it, with it, well, instantly when they open up the builder. Uh, turns out that they just, you know, they've experienced something they haven't seen before and they're not used to, right? They, they don't know how those parts connect together and what they could connect to. Maybe they, they seem limiting to them. We don't know. Uh, what if what if we just you know showed them Lego instead? Maybe their creativity would have been stimulated in other ways. So putting putting an unknown toy in front of them really didn't help. And clearly we well the kids while playing had you know zero reference or maybe zero pointers to what they can build, right? So clearly points three and four were the key to the solution that we got from the context of watching the different uh, screen recordings. And with that qualitative analysis, my question shifted from being, was the builder fun to use, to why is the builder not stimulating creativity, right? They had all, well, one would say, they have all the toys in the world in that builder, but they, they weren't creative. We, we didn't make them creative enough to, you know, we didn't enable their creativity to build any anything they could imagine. So how did we react? Well, back to square one. We went back to the drawing board and with little time remaining, we, you know, had to, impossible, to do the impossible in front of our investors, uh, in front of the CEO, just to prove that, hey, we need to change something. We have to work on something. And well, uh, Eureka struck me one day when I was just, you know, I had this habit of, you know, picking a bunch of Lego bricks before going to my workstation. And I would just lay those in front of me and just play with those, random, fiddle with those randomly throughout the day. And at the end of every day, I'd find a different creation out there and they look, oh, hell, this is, this is it. I always had a small quantity of parts, a limited random set of parts, which every day turned into some different random weird creation, not funky of sorts. So this was one of the keys, you know, with the, with the right hypothesis in mind that was reinforced by data. The things that I did, you know, contributed to the solution. So later on, we just rethought the whole interface um, by removing, you know, obviously the blue, switching it to yellow to something more energetic. Um, which reflected, you know, the corporate brand a little bit better, perhaps. And the most striking uh, change was that, OK, we showed, we decided to show the whole library. Why not? We kept the search, we added some categorization, and we showed the parts. We're showing the parts now, and we're also showing the ones that are used. And we're, we made the focus, you know, on Lego as an example, right? Because, you know, Lego is one of the more popular toys in the market and, you know, kids just knew what to build with it. So as we as we research further with the new designs, with the new iteration, we just started observing that, hey, kids are starting to build houses with Lego. They're starting to build some scenes from movies and Avengers and names, Batman, whatever. And they started to imagine like, I want to I want to paint this yellow because this is sand. I want to paint this yellow because this is gold. I want to I want to make this red because he stepped into blood. Or, I don't know. So further qualitative research unlocked, unlocked, you know, ways to monetize more and add more features like customization where you could buy extra stuff later and all that. So really qualitative data saved the day. Um, you know, the video recordings just opened a whole new window onto how how our users were using the tool, which we could not have, you know, figured out um, by looking at numbers, really. So the impact of the redesign was was significant. Like we missed the deadline by one month. We overtimed a lot, us and the development team. So props to them two years ago. But we had twenty five thousand users. Uh, sign up in just three quarters, and we've rolled out we've rolled out uh, the gamification strategy by the end of 2018, and we managed to get our first penny in uh, like early early in 2019, which which signified that you know we steered the product in the right direction, and I'd I'd really like to thank qualitative data for that qualitative analysis 
because uh, you know we're analyzing something like creativity and what stimulates it and you know i think qualitative data analysis was you know collection and then analysis was the way to go so some takeaway lessons that i would like to share personally is startup founders are really afraid to test their core ideas like it would really take someone from the outside with you know steel balls to just go and tell them hey why don't you try it out why don't you validate your hypothesis maybe it's maybe it's bollocks and you just have to do it all over again now the second thing is that you know data helps approve of this or not data helps you uncover usability issues that are impossible to detect using heuristic methods because you know heuristics get you this far your expertise in the domain gets you this far but users are different and you can get into the head of everyone you, that might use your tool so data is really an enabler to good ideas now and a key point here number three is that qualitative data really adds the valuable context that you know you cannot otherwise capture with numbers with data because how would you know how would you know with numbers that this user is lost or how do you know that this user is stressed at this moment in time or that the experience wasn't really good you can measure effectiveness really well with numbers you can measure uh, you know usability aspects that really are quantizable but measuring something like feelings measuring something like creativity like fun is something that i guess uh, should be you know delegated to qualitative methods of analysis and research now one pitfall uh, one pitfall with 3100 minutes of screen recorded video we were on the verge you know of on the brink of just falling into the abyss of data and just drowning in it because analyzing like 10 20 000 minutes of video footage would have been impossible really so be careful when you have too much qualitative data because you know you would end you would end up you know spending too much time on analyzing it while you don't need that much time ali you've got uh, like, five more minutes mm -hmm. sorry for oh yeah you're awesome. done so yeah we're good thanks all for watching and if you have any questions we're really happy to answer those me and pete so thanks a lot thanks a lot for sharing the insights this was really informative and this i think is not a very often case of when you have an ability to run such a you know full full cycle of the research you have access to the focus groups and uh, you know the way you handled uh, testing with kids was just awesome. Um, so thanks for this. Um, and uh, well, we got question, and I'm not even sure whether it's. Um, I believe it maybe is for Potter. Uh, so the question is, could the design of empty or incomplete screens in the first phase save time or help demonstrate possible issues? Um, if you think. You can both answer that, please. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we can uh, both answer it because uh, I think it's relevant for both parts uh, of uh, our webinar. So I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, on the first phase, uh, it's safe time and uh, any kind of visualization of your idea, it's uh, something like must have cause uh, one story when it's uh, in the BA stories and completely different stories when you put something on paper. So that's the uh, start point. But uh, if uh, to continue with my story, uh, that's good in the beginning. But after that, uh, it will be much better if uh, you will receive some real data on that. So some real if you somehow receive data about real usage. So that's really helped it, and it was in my story and uh, Ali, please uh, answer. Yeah, I'd like to add to Pete's point. Actually, that's a nice question. It's like the chicken or egg goes first, but uh, really uh, if you're a startup and you have no, uh, no initial design, how would you pitch that to the investors? How would you get your first round to keep you afloat? So you have to start with anything. And I don't think that the expert, you know, experts input at the start is ever going to go away. But the earlier you can get to data, as Pete's saying, would prove beneficial and you know would save you cash in the long run. 
Oh, okay. Thanks, Anonymous. It was an excellent question. <laughs> uh, the author is Nikita Solovyov for this oh, question. Nice. So I think uh, this is a really great topic to to raise while we want to show like a very attractive kind of prototype uh, to the stakeholders to make a sale. We still need to not forget about empty states and the actual chance of having a lot of um, you know user generated content at the start. Um, it looks like uh, we got one more question. Yes, we've got um, a question from Karina. Thanks, Karina. Yeah, let me let me read it aloud. How did you motivate the kids to participate in the study? Are there any differences in approach in conducting the qu quantitative uh, studies with kids compared to adults? <laughs> Are there any tips or tricks to make these studies more fun for the kids? Well, I remember there was pizza. <laughs> And some um, in-game uh, like 10,000 points. So any other tips? <laughs> yeah, we actually, if PT remember, we removed that slide. I was like, I let them ask about it. So it's good that you asked. Thanks for the question. Yeah, indeed, it was it was otherworldly. Like uh, getting the kids on board was simpler than we expected because you know we're selling their parents an idea to uh, get their kids to an activity that is free that is interactive, that could help them learn something, and that would feed them at the end of the day. So it was basically the parents, uh, you know, consent. And we got it really easy, uh, easily because, you know, they just had an opportunity to, you know, give us their kids, lend us their kids to have fun uh, for free on a Saturday. So that's part one. Uh, part two was, yeah, one, kids really don't lie. And I think I mentioned this in the presentation. So asking them question always, you know, yields the best results. So if you, if you're, if you fear, <laughs> if you, if you fear about, you know, getting upset and uh, don't ask anything to kids because they will tell you the truth. If you're afraid of the truth, don't ask kids. Be prepared to, you know, make extra precautions. You're working with kids, it's a very big responsibility. You need to make sure that there are no scissors, no, you know, no glue, nor no toxic, you know, things that they could, you know, hurt themselves with, hurt others with, uh, damage property, because, you know, you're taking care of the kids, you're taking care of someone else's auditorium. So you want to be extra peeled for any you know, behavior that could go wrong. Uh, be prepared to you know, escort so many kids to the bathroom because you know they're kids. Um, and it would be a nice option to pick a room that's closer to the bathrooms actually, and perhaps to a place where they could eat so that you would minimize the time to really, like those are logistic stuff, stuff but like minimize the, the time on transporting the kids, like guiding them from point A to point B, because, you know, it would be horrible to, you know, lose someone in the business center because, you know, the, the repercussions could be bad. Um, that's perhaps that. To keep them motivated and happy, well, you you have to be there. Like, you have to be present. You have to be the animator. You have to ask them engaging questions. You have to try to crack jokes. Uh, you have to try to be playful. So a lot of soft skills are really required here that otherwise would not be needed when working with adults who are more serious and who, you know, who can focus without extra motivation. You might have hyperactive kids. You might have less active kids which you would need to motivate differently so you need to keep an eye out on those i read a few manuals on working with kids before starting this uh, this session so they really helped yeah google is your friend <laughs> pete do you have any sense in this regard uh, no 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 that's perfect thank you so the main answer i think uh, that's the great uh, program for saturday day <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I agree. <laughs> It's better than the zoo. <laughs> sure. Right, you as a parent know understand this. Yeah. <laughs> I think we had the question from. Uh, yes, from Natalia. We got a new one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, what is the optimal amount? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, what is the optimal amount of users to participate in both kind of researches? Really good one. Really good one. <laughs> Do you want to start from the first one or you want me to you know, bombard? The... Yeah, please start. OK, so um, as I mentioned uh, in the end of my, pa my part, like when you're working with qualitative data, you, you, you might really want not to over, you know, <laughs> over interview or over uh, gather uh, qualitative information because it just it's just slower to analyze, like just reading comments, uh, doing sentiment analysis in your head takes a while now. There are startups that are working on implementing AI 
for doing semantic text processing, natural language processing that would give you the insights that you're after, which would in turn enable you to gather more feedback and analyze it quickly. Uh, but still, you know, to date, uh, I feel that gathering too much qualitative data is, uh, you know, can harm you uh, because the more data you gather, the more biased you could become. Uh, it's really a good question because there is no definitive answer. I would suggest to stratify your your uh, recruitment uh, to find people with different contexts to find uh, you know you have to be an expert ethnographer right to do this correctly you need to find the person a person that is you know from one group and then the other group and someone from the most distant group from all of them and just find people who are different who look at the same thing like if you look at the work of there's a paper on universal design guidelines and it really it really encompasses uh, the target audience that was used to research. I forgot the author of this paper. It's a 1999 paper in ACM communications and engineering. Uh, but hey, it's about universal design, so it has some good it has some good insight on who to recruit. Now, in my opinion, about quantitative data, the more you have, the merrier, because you know it it you know it flattens the curve for error and it flattens the variance in the long run. But maybe Pete has a few cents to add here. Uh, no, that's good. Uh, we've got uh, another question to you, and we've got just uh, one minute, so if that's enough to you to answer, it will be great. Okay. Yes, question for Ali. Did you analyze competitive products early on the initial stages of the development? For example, Tinkercad. Uh, good one. Uh, we actually, so the startup uh, actually began by acquiring uh, an open source tool uh, and made it closed source. So they bought it from its original author for a couple of tens of thousands of dollars, which leveraged on building Lego bricks. Uh, we were we were unique in, in the sense of the number of toys that we had included and the different connections that we could make. Unlike uh, Lego's official tools for building, you know, their um, their to with their toys. Unlike uh, other third party constructors that were predominantly on mobile uh, on mobile technology at that time, which was slightly more powerful, knowing that Unity kn knew how to publish well for Android and iOS. We decided, strategically decided not to use Unity Web Player, if that's interesting to you, because, well, we were like looking into an Oracle because it got discontinued not long ago, and thank God we went with pure WebGL, uh, well, with 3GS, and we didn't have this, uh, we, have, we didn't run into this problem. So if that answers your question. Well, I hope so. I think it's time for us to wrap up. Thanks again for an awesome, like two awesome presentations. Um, and uh, this is a really great job and really great example of the properly completed researches. Thanks a lot, and I hope we will see you very soon. We hope so. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.